You may be seated. Well, I just say once again, good morning to you. It's really good to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to be saying that for a while because it seems like we just blinked. It was Easter just a few weeks ago, and we blinked, and all of a sudden we were watching TV and our devices and our iPads and all that kind of stuff. And um, then we blinked again, and we were kind of back in and we blinked again and we were out and we didn't know how long that was going to be and so I don't have to recover the whole thing you've been there with us haven't you so but it's just good to be in the house of the Lord today what, a, what aren't you grateful and thankful to God to be once again in the sanctuary I mean we go to all that expense to build these wonderful things and to be able to sit comfortably and all that but uh, we do recognize now that it doesn't take a really cushy seat and air conditioning to, to worship and honor our God. Amen? So, I mean, we can do it in the worst of times and the best of times, but thank you, Lord. I prefer these kinds of times. Today, so. Today I'd like for us to get a sense of a people. Uh, it's a people that are uh, a part of a new formed assembly. It's kind of a church plant, an early church plant uh, in the earliest days of church planting. It was here at the Thessalonian church that Paul, along with Silas and, and Timothy, they wrote to a group of believers. Uh, they, they, they wanted to write to this new group of believers. It's not a church that does not need instruction, as we'll find in the coming weeks. There is some instruction that needs to take place for all that they were dealing with. But for who they are, as young of a church as they are, they have received some Notoriety. I mean, they're getting some press. Uh, it's the night shows are coming on, and uh, you know, you're really getting press when they develop a theme song for you, right? You know, they do, uh, for the nightly news, they develop that theme song, and it's yours. No, no, this is a group that it's getting some no notoriety. Paul, in our text this morning, uh, is proud. He's proud. He is happy of this report that he has gotten about this newly formed group of Christ followers, some Jews, but mostly Greeks. And Thessalonica was a large port city in the Aegean Sea in modern-day Greece with a population of nearly 200,000. That's a pretty good-sized population, even for today's day that we live in. The city, it was filled, though, with pagan worshipers of idols sporting the full pantheon of Greek and Roman gods and was known just as well for its emperor worship. It was a city that was, a, was very loyal to Caesar, you know, hail Caesar. They, and it granted them, those citizens uh, of Thessalonica many privileges. You know, when you get in line, when you do what you're supposed to do, you get some things. <laughs> Isn't that right for the day that we live in? If you do it the prescribed way, you're going to get some things that, that maybe you wanted. Well, Paul came to the city and he began preaching and teaching uh, uh, in the local Jewish synagogue. That's where he would go. And for three full Sabbaths, Paul preached and he reasoned with the Jews uh, from the scriptures. He explained to them and reasoned with them that the promised Messiah had to come and die and be raised from the dead. And after reasoning with them, and explaining with them the life and the death and resurrection to them, Paul, he further explained, he proclaimed to them boldly, he said that Jesus, this Jesus, he says, that I am proclaiming to you, he is the Messiah. Now, in our day, we'd go, well, right. You know, you're like, yeah, that he is. We know that. But, but then that'd be a big deal. That'd be a, a very big deal, especially in a Jewish synagogue. Acts 17 tells us of this account. It says that Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as Paul's custom, he went into the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and he proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said that this Jesus, just like I just said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Does that still impact us today? He is the Messiah. If he isn't, we're still waiting and we're in error. But if he is, well, he is. It's everything. I mean, it really means something to us. So he explained these prophecies and that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. And he, and he told him that this is the Messiah. In verse 4 of, uh, of Acts there, it says, Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men, and a few 
prominent women, it says. But some of the Jews were jealous. Oh, I wonder what's going on over at that new church. You know what I mean? Well, I've heard about them, but I don't know. You ever had some of those discussions? Or had somebody give you those discussions? Well, I heard that they hmm, were light on theology. <laughs> you know, what happens when, when, when God begins to do a movement somewhere? I, I remember being in, in Topeka when one of these churches that had, uh, they'd only been around for a few short years, and all of a sudden we started hearing stories about this, this new church in town. It was a church plant from another church, and something Something took hold, and all of a sudden, this church is growing. I mean, it's exploding. We had never had a church probably of over 12 or so hundred, and this church is all of a sudden running 3,500, we heard. And it's like, wow. And they're selling their property, and they bought this big property, and they're building this new thing. And, and I begin to hear the comments. Well, you know, <laughs> that church. And I thought, well, what do you mean that church? Well, you know, they're, yeah, you know, they're from this church kind of belief and I thought what do do they believe in the gospel do they believe in the good news because I'm excited for them if that's what they're about if they're about the Christ that we know the Christ that we've received I think that's a great thing I hope they run 10,000 one day because that just means the gospel of Jesus is spread even further and wider than we ever hoped or dreamed of in that particular city well I don't know they're one of those churches one of those I don't care I mean do you care the, the, the exact I won't go there <laughs> I'm just glad the gospel's being preached that the good news is making its way out to others so some of the Jews were jealous you know what happens when the new ministry in town starts having new converts you start hearing about it and people make some kind of some people make some kind of excuse about it it gets the other churches that aren't doing a lot kind of upset or maybe we don't know what else to do and we don't know what else to do to try to get that gospel word out but they get upset so much so in Paul's case that the new Thessalonian believers they sent Paul and Silas to Brea to, to continue doing ministry it was no longer safe for them to stay there in Thessalonica and, and then from Brea Paul went to Athens and he wanted to see he really wanted to see this new church he only spent maybe a month with them or so he wanted to see them again and he could not stand to be away any longer so he sent Timothy to go and and encourage them and, and Timothy he returned with a report uh, Timothy's report was super encouraging if you didn't you know we don't have internet so you can't just go look at the Thessalonica Facebook page and see what's going on there they, 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 uh, they had to get, 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 go, go get a report find out what's going on there and, and, and while Thessalonica was experiencing this, this church, this new church was experiencing affliction, they were holding fast to their faith. They were hanging on. I mean, we don't, we have some forms of, uh, I guess, oppressiveness. And, you know, a, a lot of it's come up during the pandemic thing. You know, we can't go to church and they're picking on the church. And I don't know, everybody's getting picked on, really. But these people were being persecuted. You could lose your life. And so the report comes back regarding these believers. And Paul, with that report of Timothy regarding these believers, he penned this letter from Corinth. And we read it in God's word this morning from 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10. 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10. Let's read that together. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Here's what it says. Paul's writing to these, this new church that's being persecuted, that's going through affliction, but they're holding fast. It's a new little work that's going on. And he says this. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Uh, we are writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, the good news, it was not only with words, but with the power for the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true and you know of our concern for you 
from the way we lived when we were with you. So we received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe sufferings it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Acacia, or Achaia. Uh, and now the word of the Lord is ringing out. It says, the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever you go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We, we don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols and served the living and true God and they speak of how you are looking forward looking forward can you believe it in the day that we're living the theology that's out today that they were actually looking forward to the coming of God's son from heaven Jesus whom God raised from the dead he is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment this the word of God for the people of God and we say thanks be to God father thank you for your word bless it pin it to our hearts again may we become a people like these in Thessalonica, Lord, that even while we're being displaced or whether we're, uh, whatever is upon us that seems very difficult and challenging, Lord, the joy of the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit is with us. We pray that would be our case in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to tell you a story about two very powerful men who lived at the turn of the 13th century. Do you remember? <laughs> Probably not. But it was right at the turn of the 13th century. The first of these men, chose, he chose the name Innocent. Innocent. He was actually Innocent the Third. <laughs> the first of these chose that name Innocent when he was unanimous, unanimously... unanimously declared Pope in 1198 that's 1198 the year of our Lord he, he took Jeremiah 110 as his ordinations verse it said this see today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down to destroy and overthrow to build and to plant that was his verse isn't that a great plan? what a great verse you know uh <laughs> tongue-in-cheek uh, Pope Innocent lived by this verse Innocent believed that his position gave him power to rule over all of the people anyone who challenged him was subject to excommunication uh, he used his position to intimidate kings and rulers he declared uh, King John of England to be subject under his rule and he even tried to claim that all of England belonged to Rome Innocent III was the most powerful Pope in history yet his name really you didn't wake up this morning going I was just thinking about Pope Innocent III. I didn't wake up that way. I, I, I assume that you, you didn't either. So his name is largely forgotten today uh, other than a historical figure. At the same time that, that Pope Innocent was amassing his power, there was another man from a tiny town in Italy that was laying down his own power, setting it aside, as it were, to take up the cross of Christ. This man, his name was Francis he was born of a wealthy family in a small town of Assisi. You remember him, right? He lived a life of ease and self-centeredness until two tragic events brought him to his knees at one point in his life. He suffered a serious illness. And then number two, while serving as a soldier, he was taken captive for about a year. Through his sufferings, Francis came to know Jesus Christ and he dedicated himself to serving Christ among the poor and the sick of the day that he was living. In the day when poverty was rampant, Francis turned his back on his family's wealth and lived as a beggar. He ministered among lepers, even embracing and kissing those whom the rest of the world called outcasts and unclean. Francis took as his motto this out of Matthew 10, 7 through 10. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Francis had no power, as the world would define power, yet the power of God working through him gave him an influence that was greater than anyone would ever have imagined. In that day, the church had to give its seal of approval to any new religious group. Want to plant one? You got to come before this church to get permission. 
So they had to go to the official church to get the approval. So Francis and his crew, they, they, they traveled to Rome to gain an influence with, the Pope, with Pope Innocent. Innocent took one look at the, this little simple missionary and he suggested disdainfully that Francis go roll in the mud with the pigs. Now that's a warm welcome, is it not? Just go roll in the mud with the pigs. The pompous Pope had no idea who he was dealing with though. You see Francis, in all his humility, he left the papal offices and went to the nearest pigsty where he rolled on the ground in the mud he wasn't thinking of his position his sole focus was continuing his ministry among the poor and the sick and he needed the Pope's approval to be able to do so if that required Francis humiliating himself at the direction of the papal authority then he would gladly humiliate himself and Pope Innocent took notice <laughs> He, he was so moved by Francis' devotion that he gave official status to the Francis' ministry. And that ministry continues today through hundreds of schools, hospitals, and service ministries led by the Franciscans. Francis' influence, it continued some 822 years after he lived. How cool would that be? Because he gave up his power in order to let God's power work through him. Two men, one had enormous power, the other had much more lasting influence. One was, the, for the most part, forgotten in history. The other became famous even 822-odd years later. You see, in any organization, whether it's on the job or at home or in the community or even in the church, there are two kinds of power. There is positional and there is personal power power. We, we do what our bosses tell us to do. I do. <laughs> you do. We all do. Position matters. It's also true at home. You know, children, they obey most of the time. But there's a difference between the raw exercise of power and influence. Innocent three had power and was forgotten. Francis had influence and was made famous. This morning as we, as we read, you, you can imagine as we read through these scriptures, this newly formed group of believers living in a world that's hostile and hung up on power and position. Some people say this doesn't have anything to relate to us. Hmm. People who are hung up on power and position I think it has a lot to tell us. Living in a world that's hostile, uh, they are being uh, commended. This group in Thessalonica, they're being commended by Paul for the report that he's received about them. The report and Paul's subsequent commendation, it, it tells us what is needed to have this kind of faith that's made famous. Paul says to them that we think of your faithful work, think about this, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and your enduring hope. This is what the, 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 perhaps Paul and Timothy and Silas, they were thinking about this newly formed church and they were thinking about their faithful work, their loving deeds, and their enduring hope. Their work and their labor, it was evident in that the gospel had gone throughout all, uh, all their provenance of Macedonia, but, but even into the neighboring provenance of Achaia in verse 7 and 8. Endurance was something that would need, they would need in the midst of persecution. Uh, it's not just easy, walk down the street, hand out your, your what did we used to hand out? <laughs> remember those tracks that we used to hand out? <laughs> the scary tracks, I remember. Whoa, even as a Christian kid, they scared me. It's like, that's scary. Uh, but, but that's not going to happen in the day that they're living, right? <laughs> We'd walk up to people and say, do you know if you died today where you'd go? And people would be like, uh, <laughs> to the mortuary, uh, you know, and we, we'd scare people back in the day it seemed like they were going to need something in the midst of their persecution something that perhaps we haven't really fully been through faithful work loving deeds and enduring hope I was with a group of people yesterday that continued the, the faithful work of serving others they, they, they went out and worked they, they took the love of God in their hearts and they turned it into action. The love of God that, that fills us, that continually keeps filling us, they took it and it turns into an action that is done towards others to, to bring blessings on others. That 
That's what makes our faith famous. That's what gets others to take notice of who we are. And we don't do it as a natural thing. I just, I'm a happy person. We, we do it because we're changed. We're changed from the inside out. And God has done something that we just must give to others. We must serve and love others. And as we do, the notoriety, something pops pops up and people say what's up with you why do you do those things the faith is made famous it's not only by loving and serving others it takes place in our ordinary places of our everyday lives you get that this type of thing that people notice it doesn't have to be a work and witness trip where everybody wears yellow and does something it can happen there but it happens in our everyday ordinary comings and goings of what we're doing in life when we have the joy of God that dwells within us through the power of the Holy Spirit they see it, they, they see what our actions are and they're not normal you know you, you're all weirdos <laughs> did you know that about yourself you're weirdos because you don't take, you're not all self completely self-centered you do stuff for other people to help and to love and to serve and when you do that people go what's up with that it's a little harder today because even the world's doing some of this. The world's even kind of serving like that. So it's not as different as it used to be. But that's what makes our faith famous. When we set aside our own interests and needs to love on and to serve others. And this faith is made famous. It's not only by loving and serving. Everyday, ordinary things that you do when you get up. Go in and get your coffee. You know, next time, don't just drive through Starbucks if you even go there. Uh, but go into Starbucks and greet the people behind the counter. Or if you have a gas station that you get your whatever drink you like, whatever, uh, go in and, 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 and let the joy of the Lord come out of you because they just got up. <laughs> and they're just, not at, not at Starbucks, they're up really early. But the person that just got in at the gas station, uh, you may be the person that lifts them right out of that, the mess that they're feeling and they notice something and then you'll see as we develop here what can become of that. We see others in needs. It's where we can catch a glimpse of others that are in despair and we offer them the gift of the gospel through our verbal and our nonverbal communication of the good news. My old pastor, he used to say, more is caught than taught. People see more from our lives than they catch from our words. Did you get that? They see more from our lives than they catch from our words. Did you know that by just being joyful, by just being joyful, that just being joyful during pandemic and just being joyful through the cultural upheaval, that just being joyful through, through the election cycle, that, that just being joyful through all of the, the mess that we see going on in our world, that our faith is becoming famous. By communicating the good news of Jesus through our, our daily actions, others, be, right before others, your faith is made famous. People will ask you, what are you so happy about? What's your problem, man? Like I said before, you're weird. <laughs> you're weird. Because misery loves company. And when you won't go there, something's up with you. What are you on? How can I get some of that? And they'll say, aren't you worried about pandemic? Aren't you worried about riots? Aren't you worried about who will get to be the next Supreme Court justice? Aren't you worried about who's going to get into the White House? And we say, well, no. <laughs> no, I mean, we talk a lot about it, but I, I'm not really worried. The word seems to indicate to me that God appoints rulers and kings and all those things. And then they want to know why, why? And they'll say, because our existence is over as we know it if so-and-so gets elected. Really? What kind of existence are we talking about? Because there are brothers and sisters all over the world that have nothing of the existence that we have and they got full of joy. The joy of the Lord. We had a group that uh, went on a work and witness trip and they spent 12 
uh, hours, well, they had to fly, and then they spent 12 hours going over the Andes and another five hours on a river to get to this remote little place in San Paulo, South America somewhere, and they, the, the people left their huts and gave them their beds the, to sleep on, and as they woke up before it was even morning, it was still dark, 3.34 in the morning, they heard singing singing where what was the singing what's going on the village had met up on the slab of cement that was poured by the previous work and witness team and they were joyfully singing they didn't know the language but they could hear the hymn <laughs> they could hear they they could hear the hymn that was being sung because they were joyful about the the blessings that were coming they were going to erect the rest of the building no electricity no nothing just a slab with a group of people full of the joy of the Lord, excited about not the next election, <laughs> excited about how good God is in their lives. Enter the opportunity to share that good news that life won't be over as we know it. You see, it will only be over when God says that it's over as we know it. You see, we as followers of Jesus, we should exhibit such a faithful work, such loving deeds, such enduring hope that people would just beg us for our drug. Come on, I know it's in your purse. I want some of that. Whatever's got you going so happy, they'd want some of that for our workout schedule. You must be on a new keto workout thing. I mean, you must be on something that makes you feel so good for whatever it is that's giving us the ability to overcome the adversity of the day that we're living in and showing forth such great joy that they must have some also. That's caught, not taught. You see, it's not just the words that are used to tell what the good, about the good news, of that good news, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's working and evident. Paul says it in verse 5. He says, For when we brought to you the good news, it was not only with words, that were, it wasn't just with words, but also with power for the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance. Do you all, all have full assurance this morning? <clears throat> then it doesn't matter who's elected. It, I mean, it matters to us in the realm of our country, but as followers of Jesus, who cares? <laughs> it doesn't really matter who's the next justice. I understand the worldwide view and all that, but we as followers with the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us full assurance, we know what our future holds. We know where we're going. We know what the end result is. Read it. We, we used to say, we win, we win, hallelujah, we win. I read the back of the book and we win. You're going to be so sick of winning. I, I just had to throw that in. I, I had to because we know what our end result is. We know what God has in store for us. We're a little intrepid about how it'll all play out, but it's not over till God says it's over. That's all free. That wasn't in here. Uh, just, you can tell, right? You can tell that wasn't in there. The gospel is more than a message of words. It's a message that came to the Thessalonians and to us today, a message that comes in power and in the Holy Spirit. The, the, the basic meaning of gospel is good news, evangelion in, in the Greek, but Paul, he specified that it was not just any good news, not like, hey, it's finally not so smoky outside, you know, when we come back inside. Uh, it, it's not as bad, oh, the weather's good. It's not that kind of good news. This was a good news that came from God himself. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, Paul tells them that he says this, you know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there, yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, he says, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's word, or not, uh, yeah, God's good news, but our own lives, not just the, the, the story or the words, but our own lives too. Nothing's better in the church than when we do life together. Not just talking about uh, these themes and the, these stories, but when we actually do our lives together. And, and then in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he said this, Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received this message, his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. Like we have this new concept for you. It wasn't like that as mere human ideas. It says you accepted what we said as the very 
word of God. God's very word, which of course it is, he says. And this word continues to work in you who believe. It's not something you find out, make a decision, and now go on with your life. It continues to work in and through our lives. You see, when uh, even though the church was founded in the midst of severe persecution, the good news was warmly received with great joy that came from the Holy Spirit. God was at work in their lives and is evident in that even though Paul and Silas were there for such a short period of time, how many district superintendents, which in our structure we have, would love to go in for four weeks, plant a church, and have it flourish like that? Oh my, it happens in other countries <laughs> on their way to district assembly. <laughs> they had one guy show up to a district assembly in Africa and he had planted four churches on his way to district assembly. <laughs> there you go. You see, we don't make our faith famous. God does. We don't make our faith famous. God does. In the midst of adversity, in the midst of economic catastrophe, in the midst of anarchy, lawlessness, strife, murder, and mayhem. Now I'm talking about America. We as his followers can exhibit joy. Joy. We can engage in and exhibit to and for God, faithful work, loving deeds, and enduring hope. The word indicates that when we do, when we receive the message of God, the good news, that it will be evidenced by the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Holy Spirit. You see, when the Thessalonians, uh, uh, believers, when they received the good news message with joy, they, even through the tribulation that they were going through, they became one imitators of the disciples and of the Lord. That's what they became, even through, I mean, I don't know if somebody holds you down and is, is hurting you and, and you're, you're at the point of death. It says that they became imitators of the disciples and of the Lord. And when they did, their faith became famous. The word says that they, they, they the Thessalonians, the followers became examples to all believers, both local and beyond not just in their little sphere, but even beyond. You see, when we receive the good news with joy from the Holy Spirit, when not only in the good times, but also in great adversity during the seasons of our lives, when we receive the good news message with the joy of the Holy Spirit, others will testify for us. You know when I testify the most is after I baptize one of you on a Sunday morning. That's when I go out and people say, what's going on? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you about something that happened this week. We baptized another believer, another believer. It gets excited. I want to tell their story. Mine I've told a bunch of times. I want to tell that story. And it just becomes others that will testify for us when we become what God's designed us to become. Others will tell yours and my story for what they hear and see in, a, in and through us. And that story will become forgotten or made famous. If it's for my own glory, it'll become forgotten. But it's for the glory of God, it'll become noticed and remembered. The word tells us there in verses 8 through 10, Paul says, And now the word of the Lord is ringing out. It's ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia, for wherever we go, anywhere we go. I mean, I go to Albertsons, I go down to get my car wash, and then I go over to... Walmart, and then I go down to Tehachapi. You gotta have a piece of Tehachapi. And everywhere I go, they're only talking about you guys. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome? I've heard some of those stories about y'all. I don't know which one of you. They won't tell me names, but they tell me. I ran into one of your people the other day. Man, glad about what you guys are doing up there on Highline. Well, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We're not doing nothing. God's doing it. Everywhere we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and, and how you turned away. I love this. How you turned away. See, they don't know anything until we do it differently. And if God truly changes us, if God truly comes in and transforms us, we walk differently, we talk differently, we do things differently. And when we do, they take notice. They can't help it. He says, they turned from their idols. Do we have any idols in the day we live? I got like a 65-inch one in my bedroom. Ooh, that's stepping on my own toes, is it not? I, I mean, what do we spend most of our time looking at or being a part of? 
Oh, yes, you see, when followers of Jesus, when we turn from our idols, our faith made visible. When we move away from the things that steal from us the time that is needed to do faithful work, loving deeds, and having in that enduring hope, our faith, like the Thessalonians, will become famous. When we serve with great joy the one and the true living God, our faith becomes famous. When we wait with the joy of the Holy Spirit upon us in a world that seems to have lost all hope, following, waiting, and serving our Lord, our faith becomes famous. Our faith becomes noticed. In the 13th century, Pope Innocent, his, this historical figure, he had power, and he was later, for the most part, forgotten. St. Francis of Assisi had passion and a love for people and a dedication to Christ, and he, he had a faith that was made famous Hardly anyone remembers Innocent today, but hundreds of thousands of people each year journey to the small town of Assisi to honor St. Francis. It was back in 1969, Neil Armstrong, he walked on the moon. They still, I think, see the, I think the footprints are still there. We're told that his footprints are still there. Here's a question for us. Where are we leaving our footprints are we determined to make a difference? What is our passion? How do you feel about other people? Even the ones on TV making a lot of trouble. How do we feel about those people? Answer these questions and you're on a path to becoming a person, a follower whose faith is becoming noticed. Faithful work, loving deeds, enduring hope we as God's people we must forsake our idols they're in the way we must forsake our idols return to the good news and exhibit the joy of receiving that good news with the power of the Holy Spirit sharing with others the very same and watch what God does in the days ahead is your faith becoming famous I know I personally know that the love that I've seen working through the people of Tinez I've been blessed and proud to see how God is making famous the faith of those who have received the message of God that comes from God through the power of the Holy Spirit and being exhibited by faithful work, loving deeds, and enduring hope for the future. Even during the months of trials and frustrations, we've had them, have we not? It's been frustrating. I mean, we can make being under a tent a fun thing for a while. And after a while, you get a little frustrated. It's not all that fun. But it's continuing with the faithful work, the loving deeds, and the hope that we give to others, your faith has been noticed. I've heard, I've seen such restraint. We all have opinions. But quite often, the Holy Spirit residing within us overrides those opinions. Thanks be to God. Let us keep to the faithful work. Let us do good deeds of loving kindness and to others and may our hope be contagious as we wait and work till the day of his appearing. Thanks be to God. Stand with me, will you? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these, your people. We appreciate the comments that we hear throughout our town of the love and the, the care that our people show to others. I give you thanks for that, Lord, and it brings honor and glory to you, not to us, to you. We, we give all that glory and honor to you Lord thank you for blessing these your people for blessing this great church we pray for the other churches throughout our community raise up great churches Lord that meet even greater numbers of people we're, we're thankful to be a part of the whole and bless us now as we leave this place may our joy be contagious because the Holy Spirit infuses it within us we give you thanks in Jesus name Amen